What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke, aka Dancewait here, and welcome back to this Final Fantasy VIII adventure in which I try to complete the game using attack only and absolutely no junctioning. In the last episode, we made it to the end of disc two. We beat Cypher and Idea, and we have moved on to the third disc, and it has been a hell of a ride so far. I've had a wonderful time. Thank you guys so much for the support, especially on the last part. There was a lot of cool comments and great feedback. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. Seeing me kind of dig deeper and investigate the game and give you guys all of the new information that I've been learning. And of course, a few strategies here and there to hopefully make things a bit more exciting. And so from here on, we are starting to get towards the end of this series. I hope you continue to support it. Please remember to drop a like for this one. And to everybody that's joined up the Patreon for the early access, thank you guys so much as well. The series has been a great success. So without much further ado, let's move on because this part is going to be a little bit different to what happened in the last one. And so let's get into it and talk about it. Okay then, we are on disc three and we have the mobile garden. And that means that we have a lot more freedom to go to a lot more places around the world and to potentially farm for items and equipment. So at this stage, I figured before continuing on, can I obtain anything more that's gonna help me with the particular setup that I have? Because obviously, as you guys know, my options are quite limited. One of the only things I can do, for example, is to basically upgrade my weapons. And so I had another look to see if there was anything that I could hunt for in order to get some better equipment and some weapons. So I didn't end up doing too much here. Basically, one of the main things that I wanted to fight was against the Grendel once again, so that I could pick up some more Dragon Skins slash Fury Fragments so that I could improve Zell's weapon. At this stage, I'm gonna gloss over this stuff a little bit more to kind of keep things moving. You guys get the idea. I'm not gonna bullshit you and say I got items I didn't get. Basically, that's one of the things I did do. I wanted to improve Zell's weapon and upgrade it to a gauntlet. So it gives me an extra five strength. It gives me an extra five strength and every little helps, as you guys know. So I decided to make that upgrade. That's one of the few at this stage that I could do. And then I realized that for some of the highest level weapons, I needed some adamantine from Adamantoises. And this was something that I probably spent two or three hours trying to do. Again, as usual, I wanted to do one successful fight just to prove that it's possible. And then from there on, I was going to say, okay, like, you know, you can get some adamantine and upgrade this weapon to this, this thing. Because you need multiples of them if you want to upgrade, basically, like, get the best weapons you can for some of the party members. Now, this fight was super trolling for me. Basically, with the current setup that I had, I could get really close to defeating this guy. But the reason I couldn't was because it has a move called White Wind. Now, White Wind is super frustrating because even when you're fighting lower level versions of it, it heals so significantly that it just offsets basically all of the damage that you've done. And depending on your luck, you basically get stuck at a semi stalemate where you could be punching this thing and hitting this thing with your sword for literally 20 minutes, half an hour, and you've made no progress. But the tantalizing part of it is that sometimes there is a really big gap between White Winds. You can literally batter this guy for eight to 10 minutes and not see a white wind. And so there was a few times where I started to get really close to beating it. And every single time I thought I was just about to win, it throws in a white wind. And basically it heals for like anywhere from, uh, I think two and a half to 3000 if it's put shell on itself. And if it hasn't, then it's like five to 6,000. And it was just super, super frustrating to try and beat this thing. I gave it literally two or three hours worth of attempts and tried to see if I could get some kind of window big enough to kill it before White Wind helped it to recover, but I just could not make it happen. And so I'm gonna skip over this, but I will be returning to Adamantois. But for now, I wasn't able to win against it. And so from here, in general, like the, the kind of the downfall began basically in this challenge. We peaked at the end of disc two. And as of disc three, things started to just get way more difficult. And a lot of the things I was trying to do, I was just fading at. So Adamantois failed. Then I just wanted to see if there was anything else that I could do at this stage. Like, could I defeat, for example, any Tomberries to get some, like, Chef's Knives? Uh, anything like, can I fight the Tomberry King? Can I fight Odin? I tried a few little things. I basically explored around. Uh, I tried to fight Tomberries. That didn't go too well. They killed me pretty quickly. That also means that stuff like Odin is just, in general, that kind of stuff is just pointless. And so, in general, I started off disc 3 not making that much progress. Basically, I managed to get an upgrade for Zell's weapon, and that was pretty much it for most of the early going. 
And so after that, I decided to go back to the story and move things along a bit. And so coming up next was Laguna and Co versus a Ruby Dragon. And this one I was definitely worried about because I wasn't sure about what the level cap situation was like. I was following like a GameFAQs post which had a list of every single storyline boss and what their level cap was. For some reason they don't have this particular enemy in there and so I went in blind and not knowing what to expect. And so let's have a look at this fight. Now one of the good things, one of the good things of course is that you can carry through stace effects. So Squall for example, if he's zombied, then Laguna will also be zombied. And for this one, because I wasn't sure if there was a level cap, I decided to go with obviously Squall and Laguna, that's kind of mandatory. But for Kiros and Ward, I swapped in characters that were at lower levels so that basically if it is uncapped, then I'll be able to hopefully get a lower level variant of the Ruby Dragon. So let's have a look at this fight. This guy at higher levels, it has a incredibly difficult moveset to deal with and it has very brutal stats. So let's have a look here. 261 damage was not looking very good. So the three of them together, they're barely doing about 500 damage per round. So let's see if this is going to be enough here because like my gut reaction upon seeing this was like I don't think this is going to get the job done because it had quite a lot of HP but it comes in with a claw attack which does not that much damage thankfully Laguna is zombied and at level 100 so he's generally um, for at least a claw attack like that he's, he's pretty well equipped and so yeah the fact that he's drawing the fire here I think is a good thing uh, the longer the three of us stay alive the better there is a chance of skipping. It does happen sometimes, but it's not like it's not super common or anything like that. But you're seeing a decent critical hit rate from Laguna. He's it's happening quite frequently. I think that's like two or three already in this fight. But thankfully, so far at least, you're seeing that there's not really much going on. The Ruby Dragon's not doing a lot here. And on closer inspection, I realized that this guy was a pretty low level. Thankfully, the mandatory one that they put in the story here is of a low enough level that it doesn't have the beefed up moveset with attacks like Breath and Flare and Meteor and all of that kind of stuff. So thanks to that level cap, we were able to continue on here. I will speed the fight up a little bit just so you guys can see. But um, yeah, thankfully Ruby Dragon ended up not being too much of a problem and we made it through because of the level cap. Now, one of the interesting things here is that normally I think with my standard party out in the world, I don't think I can defeat Ruby Dragons. And so this is basically almost a freebie and even the lowest level one, it drops a star fragment. There's a 5% chance. So there, this is one of those fights where if you need, let's say, fury fragments, for whatever reason you can't beat Grendel, or you need star fragments, which are difficult to obtain normally, this is a fight that you can basically keep repeating until you get the drop that you need. And so that's why this battle is pretty unique, because Ruby Dragons, with these restrictions in general, they're just not an enemy that you can defeat. They're just too powerful. And so this is a, an exception to that rule. And so you can use it for useful items potentially. But for me, I decided to basically use the most common drop that you get from this fight, which is an Inferno Fang. So I got Fury Fragments here, but I basically changed that to Inferno Fangs because the only two enemies that drop these are Hexa Dragons and Ruby Dragons. And both of them I basically can't defeat. And so I decided to take the Inferno Fang. And with that, I'm able to make an upgrade and get the Crescent Wish for Selfie. So that's something that I did. And then from there, I decided to say, you know what, let's continue the story because I don't think that there's too much more that I can do in terms of uh, weapon upgrades at the moment. And I just wanted to push forward and see what was going to happen next. And so I went towards Estar and the next boss battle in this challenge. Okay, my friends, here we go. The next boss fight in the Fire Fantasy VIII attack only, absolutely no junction challenge is Abaddon. And this is where the challenge ended <laughs> unfortunately let me explain as you're watching the fight here this guy has 17,000 hp at the level cap it's only a level 39 17,000 level 39 you think that can't be too bad but you're seeing squall only doing about 140 damage here this guy is undead therefore it's taking half damage from any physical attacks that's stage one. So already uh, our damage output is looking pretty feeble against it. That's already a very bad start. It has some pretty hard hitting attacks there. It hit for, it hit for 410 against a zombie. So that's already not looking good. Uh, this was like my first kind of, you know, test fight. And then it stands up and look at the damage now. 11, four, 
and five. When it stands up, I had a look at the battle script. It gains a plus 500% increase in defense. So as an undead and as uh, a 500% increase, it basically has a 1000% increase in its physical defense and it can fire off Confuse while it's standing up. So I think you're putting the pieces together here. Uh, you can see that there is no RNG situation here that really is gonna help you out of this one. And I was really sad because I wanted it to be like a more significant story boss to put an end to this part of the challenge. Uh, but unfortunately it was a bad end. There genuinely was no way that I could find here. So yes, there's been a few fights where I said, oh, I thought it was over, but then I found this, I did that. For this one, I genuinely could not find a way. Um, I tried like triple zombies. I tried one petrified, two zombies. I tried two petrified and one zombie. Um, I just did everything I could. Um, I had a look at the battle script um, in hindsight. At this time, I didn't have access to battle scripts yet, but I looked at it in hindsight and there's no like holes that I could find that I could exploit. Um, unfortunately, the chances of it skipping turns is also low, I believe. It's a bit of a complicated battle script and I'm not that great at kind of deciphering it. But at best, there's a one in five chance that it skips it. Uh, it might not even be that. If I, I might have misunderstood it, it might be even rarer than that. But basically the eye test also showed me that it almost never skips turns. The only time it seems to do it sometimes is the first turn after it kind of sits back down after it was standing. Uh, other than that, there's there's basically no holes uh, in this defense, unfortunately. And so this mixture of just insanely high defense that I cannot get around, uh, the constant confusion that you have to deal with, where you either hit yourself or you have to try and hit uh, your teammates in order to kind of snap them out of it, so do more damage to yourself. And the fact that it has 17,000 HP while having basically a plus 1,000% in terms of defense uh, against a normal sub it just proved too much and unfortunately um, I think in my best attempt I got it down to like 7,000 8,000 something like that and in the grand scheme that was like a really good attempt and it was barely like 60% of its maximum HP it was just nowhere near uh, maybe there is some kind of you know astronomical RNG where you could grind this battle for months and probably find a way through but that's where I personally drew the line. It was like, okay, you know, uh, I need to get the series done. I need to complete uh, the challenge if I can. And so this was the time in which I had to unfortunately end the no junctioning, like absolutely no junctioning part of the challenge. So I will continue to show like the, this battle in the background so you can see how it worked out. And I will tell you guys about the next chapter in this challenge as we push ahead to try and complete the game. So from here on, I wasn't really satisfied with just saying, okay, now I'm allowed to junction. I'm just gonna basically go to the easiest form of this challenge that I can, where you could basically, for example, you could junction GFs, you could equip draw onto your characters and then just draw from like the world points, um, just like stack lots of um, magic that you can get from around the world and then just start junctioning things to stats and try to get them as high as possible and just, you know, junction to elements, junction to status elements, do all of that kind of stuff. And so I thought that's a bit of a push. Uh, I wanted to find some kind of middle ground where I still found it like interesting in terms of the challenge. And it felt as close to having no real junctions as possible. And so this is, again, like this is completely made up from, from my point of view. Like at the end of the day, we're still going by the attack only mantra where when we are in combat, we are only using the attack command. So that still remains the same. But in order to keep things interesting for me, the way I decided to tackle it was to first of all, junction GFs, obviously, and then only use the passive abilities that we get. Because if there's one thing we don't get in this game is basically you don't have armor and you don't have accessories. You also don't have stuff like materia. And so if you take all of those things away, it's so restrictive compared to Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy X that I felt like the best place to start would be to use the GF's passive abilities, which to me are basically like the kind of abilities that you would find on accessories or on armor if you could equip them. So they don't change, like you don't junction directly to your stats, but you use the passive ability slots to give yourself some benefits. So that's the first thing. And the second thing was basically allowing myself to start using things like card mod, because we do have Kazer Kotal, Quetzal Kotal, Quasar Kotal, I don't know how you pronounce it. That guy knows the card mod, and with that, obviously, we can start to get certain things that we previously couldn't. 
So that was my starting point. I wanted to use card mod and I wanted to be able to junction GFs and use their passive abilities. Now, as luck would have it, we literally only have three GFs so far in this run. Because we can't use the draw command in battle, we can't draw any of the ones that we could have got from boss battles anyway. Other than that, the only other GFs you can get are the ones that you can defeat in battle, and they're too powerful at the moment. We can't defeat any of them in battle either. So it was kind of funny. I literally had one GF for each character to work with here, and so that's basically what I did. I gave Squall Ifrit, I gave Irvine Shiva, and I gave Zell Quasar Kotal for now, and I decided to have a look at their passive abilities. Now, straight off the bat, uh, Ifrit had a strength plus 40 and a strength plus 20, and so those are the ones that I equipped on Squall, and that already gave him a nice strength boost to, to begin things here. And unfortunately for Irvine and Zell, in terms of passive abilities that they inherently have, that was kind of it. I didn't really have anything that was that useful to me from there on. And so then began the quest of trying to understand which passive abilities can I get for my GFs and are they obtainable in this particular run? And so it was back to researching once again and seeing what I could do. Now, early on, one of the first things I had already that was quite easy to get was an item that can teach your GFs the HP plus 20% passive ability. And so you can obtain these from Wendigos and I decided that this would be a nice place to start. And so that's basically what I began to do. And you can see how my stats have started to change as a result. So Squall at level 100 gets a nice 60% strength boost. And that already basically makes him a lot more dangerous and way more able to dish out big amounts of damage against even enemies like Abaddon, at least while they're sitting down. And so at this stage, that's what I am doing. But what am I not doing? For now, I'm still not stat junctioning anything. So I am not attaching any kind of magic to any kind of stats right now. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing any status junctioning. I'm not doing any elemental junctioning. So all of those menus continue to not be used. So I'm not using the draw command with anybody. I don't want anyone to have anything junctioned other than attack onto their characters at any point in the game. That's another one. And the final thing is I decided to, from this point onwards, I am only going to obtain anything that is obtainable from this point forward. So what I didn't want to do was to kind of be like retroactive and just say, oh, well, if I had played the game differently right from the start and I had done a different challenge, this is where I would be at right now. An example of this is something like if I was to say, oh, I was allowing uh, passive abilities from the get go, then I could junction Ifrit to Squall when he was at much, much lower levels and I could give him the strength bonus passive ability and as a result his strength stat would have been a lot higher by now by the time he's at level 100. So hopefully that makes sense. I didn't want to just kind of retrospectively just change everything and just start giving people like different things I'd never had all along. It was more of a like we pushed it as far as we can with these restrictions and from this point forward without going back and changing anything along the way what can we do and can we still complete the game by using basically passive abilities from the GFs only no stat junctions and no drawing magic at all from the world points. So let's see what happened next once I started to do this type of stuff. And so from this point forward, things definitely went up a notch or three. Basically, what I wanted to do was to get past Abaddon as soon as possible. And I wanted to find out what I needed to be able to do that. And so we already have Ifrit with his strength plus 40 and strength plus 20. And we have HP plus 20%, which helps a little bit at least for Zell and Irvine. But I wanted more. And because I'm able to do the card modding stuff now, I decided to start playing a few rounds of Triple Triad in order to get a card that would definitely help me in a massive way. So thankfully, we can go back to Balam and we can actually play Triple Triad against Zell's mum. And if you play her enough, she will play Zell's card. And if you beat her, you can take Zell's card, then you can use card mod on Zell's card and get yourself three hyper wrists. These hyper wrists are awesome because each one will teach strength plus 60% to one of your GFs. And so since we only need three GFs and we only have three GFs, three is the magic number here. And so I did do all of that stuff. I did it manually because I hadn't played Triple Triad in ages but I did beat Zell's mum, I got Zell's card, and ultimately I ended up getting a plus 60% strength on all three of my characters, which was a massive help, obviously. And this is where we really start to, to take things to the next level and get much stronger on our way to trying to complete the game with attack only.
Okay then, let's have a look at round two versus Abaddon. We have Zell with Vitality plus 40%, Strength plus 60%. Then we have Squall with a massive 136 Strength and Strength plus 100%. And then we have Irvine with 104 Strength as a result of his Strength plus 60. And I gave him an HP plus 20% as well. And so with this, we are ready to take on Abaddon and see if with this souped up strength we're able to actually take him down despite his undead status and that super high defense when he's standing. So let's have a look at this fight. This was the proper version here and we'll see how much of a difference this stuff made. Let's see the damage now. 519. So that was a pretty good sign. And for these guys as well, definitely much, much better damage. So we're, we're almost doing a thousand damage now per round. And so getting through 17 rounds while it's sitting definitely seemed reasonable to me. And so let's see how much we had left in the tank and whether it was still close at this stage. Can still definitely slow us down with Confuse depending on when it hits and who it hits. But in general, I was pretty sure that with the damage that I was seeing here, that things were going to look a lot better. And well, considering the fact that this is undead and we're going to face bosses in the future that are definitely not undead, I was looking forward to the damage numbers that I'd be seeing against like future bosses where I wouldn't have to deal with such high defense here. Okay, so it stands up. I mean, it goes up 500%. It's just insane. So still, I mean, despite having over 100 strength, score with 136 strength plus the critical, well, the 150% damage, it's still nowhere. And so it comes in with silence. Silence is not a problem. Uh, thankfully, if you're a little bit lucky with RNG, you don't see too much confuse. But if you are unlucky, it's just gonna keep spamming it. It can use it like two, three times in a row. Yeah, so this was a bit unlucky here. Zell got confused and we ended up doing a double hit. Obviously, I, I didn't realize that Zell was going to smack himself for that one. Blind comes in and it hits Squall, which is generally okay here. Could be worse. But it's just a total nuisance, this enemy. I mean, the confusion, the, the blind, the undeadness, the high defense, the high damage from these claw attacks here while it's sitting. It's just, it was really, really brutal. And it's an enemy that I basically didn't remember. Um, in terms of it was just so easy on a normal run that this was definitely not the enemy that I predicted would end this challenge. It was probably going to be obviously like, you know, um, Raijin or Idea or Cypher or one of those guys. But no, it was a bad one. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And so, yeah, even with this setup, it took quite a long time. Again, I'm going to skip through the battle a little bit here to, to move things along. But yes, I did indeed manage to defeat Abaddon and finally continue the challenge in the slightly nerfed form. So we finally make it to the wonderful city of Estar. But there's no rest for the wicked because immediately we get another dream sequence with Laguna. And at this stage, again, I was confident. I was thinking, come on, like, you know, we've got these passive abilities. This stuff should be fine. Now, one of the problems here is that due to where we are in the story and on the world map, we can't reapply zombie status to our characters. And so we can't benefit from zombies. So Laguna, Kiros, and Ward have to do this section without having zombie to help them out. So that's one thing that was quite troublesome. And you are going to see here, this actually was a lot more problematic than I would have imagined. So let's have a look at these fights. The first one begins, we have this relatively generic soldier that hopefully shouldn't be too bad, but Laguna is at level 100 right now. So that critical was nice, uh, definitely helped here, but the enemies that we're facing here, they do level scale, they're not capped. And so as a result, we are having to deal with some very high level customers here. Thankfully, we can heal in between this fight, so that's not too much of a problem here. So definitely heal up, but as you can see, everybody is level 100 here. I basically just took Zell, Irvine, and Squall, and then I basically used them for the dream sequence. Now let's see what happens here as a result, because this fight was absolutely brutal. I looked at this and I was like, okay, come on, how hard can it be? Laguna basically killed the, the generic guy in like two turns, and we have three people here. Can't be that bad. 
So 666, that's not too bad. We can manage with that. Then that came in 845, 514. Like these are big hits. Not having zombie here was definitely hurting. And that guy took a fair few hits. Uh, I don't know why he attacked his teammate there. That guy's just crazy. But <laughs> Then death came. No zombies here, so nothing I could do against this. And one of my characters instantly gone here. And then Degenerator happened, which I completely forgot was a thing. And that removed Laguna completely from the equation. And you can guess what happened next. <laughs> Boomerang Sword. 1,726. If everybody was alive, everybody would get hit for 1,700 here. Then it did that. 900. Telekinesis. I got completely destroyed here, absolutely destroyed, and I got myself a game over. So despite using the passive abilities, I thought to myself, okay, this is going to make things much easier. I should be breezing through the next set. I was immediately in for a rude awakening as those guys completely wrecked me. Now, what I decided to do, thankfully, what you, what you are able to do, obviously, is choose who takes the place of Kiros and Ward. And one of the issues I was having here was that these guys were so high level that the enemies obviously were scaling really, really badly. And so second time around, I decided to swap in Quistis and Selfie instead of Irvine and Zell. And that way we had basically level 100, level 52, and level 42. And that meant that we were able to fight easier variants of those particular enemies. So let's see how it went the second time round, because round one was absolutely brutal. So it comes in straight away with a shotgun here. 678, that's, that's generally less damage than we were doing before. And this time I'm taking out the guy in the middle because he's got that boomerang thing and the death ability. So I'm changing my focus here. It's just got a really large array of abilities. Like it's got the normal claw, it's got the shotgun, it's got death, it's got boomerang, it's just got so many things that can hurt us here. But thankfully, as you can see, they're, they're much like lower um, health and damage here. And well, this guy, you need a little bit of RNG for it to not keep using Degenerator. And so Blind was something that we could generally live with for now. It's just like, if it forced you to use your level 100 characters here, I think I would have been really stuck. Like we would have needed some, some solid RNG uh, to beat these guys given the circumstances. So Degenerator does come in. And thankfully, it's Kiros. If it was uh, Laguna here, it might have been a bit of trouble because he is obviously the, the main damage dealer in this particular scenario. But that was a really nice critical and almost dead. But then it did a second Degenerator. So this is what I mean about the RNG. This was just brutal. But thankfully, this one hit Ward as well. And so it left itself one-on-one -on -one with Laguna. So yeah, these fights, man, they were they were tense. Like, I, I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to get through. <laughs> Did a telekinesis. You can see how tanky it is as well. Like, we haven't been able to kill it yet. So even at these levels, it's, it's not playing around. I don't know if it uses Degenerator when there's one person left. Hopefully it doesn't. I mean, I got lucky in this fight and it didn't end up using it. But you can see, I mean, it's withstanding so many attacks here. Just really tanky, difficult, annoying enemy. But thankfully, Laguna gets another critical and we get the job done. So that was a pretty fearsome encounter there. I mean, that could have gone very, very wrong. Thankfully, we pulled through. But the fun is not over yet because there are another set of battles that are mandatory for Laguna, Kiros, and Ward. And so let's have a look at this one. This one was also quite difficult. This enemy in the background was definitely a problem. And so we had to try and take these guys out as quickly as possible once again. Pretty nasty attacks here. Yep, so a stop there on Kiros. And then that attack does 800 damage as well. And that was a critical on Kiros, so just generally quite nasty stuff here. And then it casts a Protect, and there's nothing I can do about that. So it has a lot of HP. It scales pretty well, and it has Protect as well. So we are not doing very well against this guy. It has pretty good defense to start with anyway. And then after that Protect as well, it's just very tough. Beam Laser comes in, 1,066 damage there. So yeah, these guys, I mean, honestly, fair play. Like, they're, they're much, much more difficult than I expected. Ward dies. 
We really need to get this done now. We have to hope that Laguna is going to be enough to, to pull through here. It's one on one once again. But he's only able to do 400 damage at a time. He's getting some good criticals, but this is just not very good damage here. And that beam laser just keeps coming and coming. And then it goes into like this crazy weird mode. And then the protect wears off and it does another reflect beam. And it kills me. So yes, even when I had the lower level party members with me, I was still getting killed in these fights. So this section was genuinely difficult and way more difficult than I could have imagined. So here's round two. Same idea again here. This time I'm making sure to take out the guy on the left as quickly as I can. And I'm making sure Laguna attacks um, the Elastoid in the back, basically. But he gets put to sleep, which is really annoying here. Just has a really tough array of attacks. It's got like, you know, over a thousand damage from that one. It can put you to sleep, it can stop you, and it can protect itself. So just overall, really nasty enemy here. But it seems to be that Protect isn't like it does it automatically after going below a certain amount of HP. So you can see here it skipped a few turns. There's definitely some skipping going on. It, it let us get in quite a few turns and it didn't use Protect. And so this time around the RNG definitely helped me. Now watch this attack coming in here. When it goes into this like crazy spaz mode. Reflect Beam hits everybody for like 1200 damage here. And so just in time, Laguna couldn't have survived a second one of those. We just about get the job done once again. So yeah, just really brutal forced encounters here for Laguna and the rest of the team. But thankfully, we managed to make our way through them. So I'm going to move on here. There was a, a couple more, but these aren't worth showing. But those were some of the highlight battles that were definitely difficult to get through for Laguna. And so thankfully, after all of that is done, we finally gain freedom in Estar and can wander around and do what we want. Now, one of the best things about making it to Estar and having the, the new kind of restrictions that I have now, I am able to obtain an item called the Rosetta Stone. It's a really cool item because it allows you to learn ability times four for one of your GFs. And that's huge because obviously since I'm using passive abilities, it's like having a four slot armor instead of a two slot armor. And so all you have to do is go to Estar and basically just keep trying the shop again and again until it lets you have it. And that first Rosetta Stone was hugely useful. I of course gave it to Ifrit. And with that, I was able to get strength plus 60%, plus 40%, plus 20%, and HP plus 20% at the moment. And so that was a huge win for me to get that Rosetta Stone. I didn't want to do too much more after this one. I was pretty happy with where I was at, uh, especially once I got the Rosetta Stone. I thought, okay, with four slots, I should be ready to continue on and uh, progress the story a bit more. So this section is definitely a very story heavy one once all of this happens and you can avoid a lot of the kind of random encounters that you need to fight anyway. And so I will progress things on quite far. There's going to be quite a big jump here and I'm going to rejoin you guys right in the heart of one of my favorite sections of the game, the outer space section where Squall rescues Renoa and the two of them have to spend a little bit of time together and make their way through the propagators and bring it home. So let's join them in a propagator fight and see how that went because that was the next basically mandatory fight we had to have in the challenge. Okay, here we go. Now, as I've mentioned all along, we are really fortunate that Renoa naturally has a really good strength stat. And as a result, she can benefit hugely from these passive boosts because obviously they're boosting a percentage of an existing stat. And so however high the base stat is, the more that they're going to benefit from it. And so this was a nice combination. And so all we needed was for Renoa to have a nice plus 20% HP and a plus 60% strength. And with that, she basically had the same strength as Squall already with only two slots, which was really awesome. And so these two became a real power couple here with over 140 strength each and 5,000 HP to boot. But was it gonna be enough against the propagators? Let's find out. Okay, here we go. 
All of these guys are basically the same, so you can defeat one of them, you can defeat them all. So we're only going to show one fight here. Let's have a look. How much damage? 2,500. This is what it looks like when they don't have that ridiculously high defense. It does hit us for 1,000, admittedly, that's beefy. But then Renoa with a critical hits for 3,300 damage. And things are just looking completely different to how they were in the previous session thanks to the the passive GF abilities. So yes, you would have noticed that the Propagators do not have that much HP, and that's because they are level capped at level 42, which gives them 5,200 HP. And so that means that for this particular section, we are more than safe, and I don't need to show you guys anything else. Uh, as much as it is basically one of my favorite sections from the entire game, we need to move things on. So Squall and Renoa take care of business up in space, and then we come back down to Earth to continue the story. Okay, my friends. So once we return back, Renoa gets taken away temporarily, but we can go and get her back without too much issue. And now that we have her back, I decide to now go for a proper farming session now that I had my strength plus 60 and everything prepped as well. And so before heading into the Lunatic Pandora and trying to complete Disc 3, I decided to try and get a few more items so I could upgrade some weapons to their highest possible level. So there's a few highlight things I'm going to talk about here. Again, I'm not going to go through like the entire list and show everything fully. But basically, one of the things I did fight was a Triface because that was an enemy that I needed to fight for Curse Spikes. And you can see in the background here, you can encounter them in the island closest to heaven, I believe it is. And even with sort of the, the level scaling and all of that stuff, those are one of the few enemies that you can still defeat on there. And so thankfully with my party kind of set up and with the passive abilities that I have, I was able to defeat Tri-Faces and that meant that I had Curse Spikes at my disposal and it was something that I could farm for items. Aside from that guy, one of the interesting ones that I was kind of unsure about whether I could defeat or not, even with this kind of thing going on, was the T-Rexor. Now, the T-Rexor has an incredible amount of HP, but what it also has is a 1 in 3 chance of skipping a turn, and most of what it does is quite singular and their physical attacks. So if you can come in with some zombies, then you can really just kind of go to town on this guy. And even though he has massive HP, if you encounter a lower level variant, because it's a random encounter, you can encounter the lower level variant. It still has, I think, something like 50, 60,000 HP, even with the lower variant. But you can definitely take it out before it kills you. So T-Rex was kind of unexpected, but we were able to defeat it. And as a result, we're able to get Dino Bones, which are going to be used for a weapon upgrade as well. Other than that, we have the Imp that you can encounter in Estar. This is a pretty easy enemy, uh, nothing problematic about this one. And they give you Moonstones, so you can farm for those. And so, of course, I also wanted a rematch with Adamantoys now that I was able to do a lot more damage. So what I did for this fight was I swapped in Selfie because she has the lowest level of any party member. And of course, as always, I'm trying my best to bring down the average level of what I'm fighting against. And so if we do that and we get the lower level variant of the Adamantoys, it turns into a relatively easy fight as long as you don't get really unlucky with like blind spamming and white wind spamming. But I tried like two or three separate times and I was able to beat it uh, relatively consistently. And so finally, thanks to these passive abilities, we are able to obtain adamantines as well. Now the last ingredient that I'm gonna talk about specifically is the chef's knife. I have access to card mod and I do have a Tomberry card, which I got during my triple triad adventures. And as a result, I am able to card mod a chef's knife. And so let's have a look at some of these upgrades here as a result. At the moment, at least, I would love to get a lion heart, of course, for Squall, but I can't because I don't have pulse ammo right now and I don't have a way to refine it yet. But what I can do is obtain a punishment weapon, which gives me a plus 13 strength. As always with this stuff, uh, in case it's not clear, I will add in just like some extra annotation stuff just so that you know where I got these items from. But it was definitely really nice to be able to upgrade all the way up to punishment. And then, other than that, thanks to being able to pick up those dino bones and the moonstones, I was able to get an Exeter for Irvine as well, which is his best weapon. And so with that, I was able to get Squall almost to his ultimate weapon. And for Irvine, I did have his ultimate weapon. 
Unfortunately, the one thing I wasn't able to obtain was energy crystals. I tried to fight the Elnoil for them. Uh, I just could not defeat the Elnoil. It was just way too powerful. Um, I had, even despite my passive abilities and stuff, at this particular stage, the shooting star was out of reach for Renoa, and so I had to make do with the Cardinal that I had. But it was only a plus seven strength. It's not the end of the world. And the final upgrade I made was, of course, for Zell. Now that we can get Adamantines, I was able to get the Urgeis weapon for him as well. And so that means that both Irvine and Zell have their ultimate weapons. And hopefully, I will be able to get the Lionheart a little later. And so from here, before I progress the story, there was one more thing that I wanted to get my hands on. And that was through an enemy that I never thought I would have to fight in this game. And that is the Poo Poo. The reason we want to fight the Poo Poo is because if we kill it, we get accelerators. And accelerators teach you auto haste. And so basically with those ingredients, I was ready to have a run at the Lunatic Pandora and see if I could get through. The final location of disc three, the Lunatic Pandora. And we set things off with yet another fight against Raijin and Fujin. This time around, the level cap is 43. Raijin has 22,200 HP and Fujin has 17,900. So that's about 40,000 combined. Let's see if our souped up characters here can just kind of wipe the floor with these guys or if they're still going to prove a bit too powerful. Irvine sets it off with 600. That's not that much. But then Squall comes in with 1,500 and Renoa comes in with 1,000 as well. So we're doing over about 3,000 damage every time, which is pretty good. So he hits hard and he is picking on Irvine a bit here. But Irvine, in that sense, because he does the least damage, he's also the most disposable here. But I figured I didn't use the Petrify strategy here because I thought like at this stage, 600 damage per hit is probably still quite valuable. And he'd probably still tank enough hits that it would probably be worth not having him petrified and just contributing to uh, proceedings here. So, yeah, I mean, basically, Renoa and Squall still have full HP. And Fujin is not attacking very frequently, so I think Fujin has a chance of skipping too. I still, I still wasn't checking the battle scripts at this point. But it's looking pretty good here. I mean, even though he's, he's doing 800 damage, it would be 400 to Squall and Renoa, so it's not really a big deal here. And well, honestly, if Fujin was using moves like Tornado and stuff, then things would be potentially very different because our magic defense, obviously, is not that great. But thankfully, she's using Zan, and as a result, it's, it's not really helping them very much. And so this was a way, way easier fight than the one in uh, Balam Hotel. But basically, like, recording this episode and this part of the game really made me realize that even if I found a way past Abaddon, I think you could tell that I had really come to the end of the road here uh, for absolutely using no junctions. Like, okay, maybe I somehow crawl past Abaddon. Then the odds of me beating those fights that happened in the dream sequence with Laguna was also basically zero. I, I failed to see how I was going to beat those guys because I was going to come in with the same levels. Uh, they're mandatory fights. They are not level capped. And I would be doing way less damage than I was before. And so as a result, like I, it, it basically was the end point. Like one way or another, even if I beat Abaddon, then it would just would have been basically the Laguna dream sequence where things would have ended. And so disc three was, was very much the part of the game where it was just like, okay, this is too much. You cannot continue with these restrictions. Uh, no matter what kind of RNG you're trying to farm or whatever strategies you come up with, it just wouldn't have worked. But now that we have used our passive abilities and things like card mod, we are making our way through the Lunatic Pandora and setting up a showdown with Cypher and Adele. Now, this battle was cool because it gave us three strength ups, and that's a really nice drop. It was quite rare to get three of them. I think the most you can get is four, potentially. Um, I'll edit that in, but basically these are obviously going straight to score once again, and so this was definitely a really nice drop here. Now, the Lunatic Pandora as a location is quite interesting. Um, I didn't want to just run away from every random encounter here, like especially when we go to new areas. And so an Elnoil popped up and I was like, oh shit, like what am I going to do here? This is a problem. I did run away because I'm letting myself do that. But eventually I kind of realized that, oh shit, everything on the Lunatic Pandora is a level one version of itself. So for these like hardcore enemies like Elnoil and the Behemoth that's just appeared, 
it doesn't mean that you can kind of kill it in one hit, but they are so kind of inferior to their, their mid slash high tier versions that if you really do need to fight your way through here, let's say you have like a, a no escape rule in your particular challenge, it's definitely doable because you don't fight anything beyond the level one versions of the enemies in here. And so with that, we are going to head to the final boss battle that I will show for this particular episode. And that is against a mobile type eight. And so against this guy on my first attempt, I didn't quite know what to expect. And I got hit with some pretty problematic stuff. So I'm going to skip the first attempt. Uh, it did not go too well. I'm going to show you the second attempt in which I ended up being able to win. Because it was quite a tough fight, but definitely doable. So let's get into it and see how this one went. And so for the second attempt, I made a few adjustments. I dropped the auto haste for Squall. I figured he's going to get counterattacked every time anyway. So I might as well do as much damage as I can before receiving the counterattack. And so that's why I took the auto haste off and I put an extra uh, strength plus 20 onto him. And for Renoa, I decided to put a spirit plus 40%. I thought maybe that helps reduce the damage from the counterattack to a sufficient degree to make it worthwhile. So I gave it a second go after making a couple of those little adjustments. Let's see how it went. Okay, here we go, round two. Now, from the first attempt, I learned a few things. I learned to not attack the probes because you don't really do any damage anyway. And so this time, I was fully focused on the main body here. Um, even after, obviously, it does the whole, like, releasing the probes or whatever, it was, uh, was going to be me making sure that I focus on the main body. We did get an Angelo rush this time. Uh, 3,000 extra damage there. Angelo Rush is one of those things where I've said it, like I personally don't like it. Um, and if it's the difference maker in a fight, I kind of, I prefer not to, to consider it or use it. But obviously there's the whole argument that it's, it's also a passive ability. I mean, it's not something under your control. So why would you not use it? And so that's also very fair. It's just a completely like personal thing, how you want to, to treat it really. And so for me at least, um, I think this is another one of those fights where you can basically win without using it. But, you know, it did definitely help. But it's definitely doable without, I think. So this is the stage of the fight that's critical. Basically, Squall needs to be the one that stays alive the longest. And he does. And so you can see, I mean, it's totally fine. Uh, if you had 3,000 less damage, I think Squall would have definitely done like one more attack at least to be able to do it. And so that was Mobile Type 8. And the eagle-eyed amongst you would have noticed that it dropped something called a laser cannon. And that is exactly what I needed to make Squall's Lionheart. So this actually worked out really, really perfectly. And so the final thing I will mention for this episode is that I used those laser cannons. And with that, I was able to basically procure all of the individual items that I needed in order to get the pulse ammo and get Squall's Lionheart. So that's where I'm gonna end this particular episode. It began on a bit of a downer because of course Abaddon put an end to the, the absolutely no junction version of the run, which was a shame. But from there, once we started to use our passive abilities and the card mod and that kind of thing, then things started to ramp back up again and we are marching towards the end of disc three and by extension towards the end of the game. So I will see you guys soon for the next episode in which we are going to fight Cypher and Adele and try to get onto disc four. And once we get onto disc four, the only thing that stands between us and the ending of the game is to get through Ultimecia Castle and fight Ultimecia herself. So we are almost there, my friends. It's been a really, really fun journey. I am looking forward to sharing what could potentially be the final episode with you guys for the next one. As always, early access is going to be available on Patreon alongside some other perks, and I would appreciate anyone who hasn't checked it out already to have a look on there because it supports the channel in a huge way and helps me to continue to make these wacky projects for you guys to enjoy on the channel. And so with that, I am going to wrap things up. I am really looking forward to sharing the finale of this challenge with you all and then moving on to whatever we're going to get into next on the channel when it comes to this type of challenge material. So I will see you soon. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for the love and support. Please remember to drop that like on this video if you haven't already, and I will see you for the next one.